Good evening. Thank you for coming. And thank you for having some interest in Ernst Barlach. It was 10 years ago when I visited my sister in Germany, I had the chance of encountering his work. It was in the city of Münster, where I also studied and where my sister teaches and lives nearby, that throughout the city in different locations, mainly churches, his work was displayed. So we could, would go from one to the other, to the other, to the other. We are immersing. And at that occasion, because I was so deeply moved, I bought this bronze replica. And <clears throat> throughout the evening, you will see sculptures by Barlach, of course, as slides. So you can't walk around. You can't see it from all sides. This is the only one available. The original was out of wood, not bronze. And he did it in 1926. And it is 103 centimeters high, out of walnut. So very different, you can say. But what I learned was when it is the gesture that you want to enter in and you take time, then it is not so important how big the form. Yeah, also in a, into a small form you can enter. And this, of course, is what you will see tonight. I can show you what <clears throat> I could find. Partially um, I scanned but then I also found what's commonly available through the internet. So these are not necessarily the original works, but later casts, yeah, whatever sizes they are. So that said, the size is not so much our concern tonight. Yeah? Before I begin, I want to give credit Ten years ago, during that exhibition, I found also this book. And this book, luckily written in English, written by Naomi Jackson Groves, Ernst Barlach, Life in Work, Sculpture, Drawings and Graphics, Dramas, Prose Works, and Letters in Translation. You heard, he was not a sculptor only. He also did drawings, lithographs, woodcuts, many illustrations. He was a drawer, he drew uh, from youth on, was part of his growing up, you can say. And was often his first entry into looking for a gesture. But then he also became a writer. He started writing and he trained as a sculptor. So before you see his work, you should know where he lived. And born in 1870 and dying in 1938 at the age of 68, in the hospital of Rostock, but at that time he lived in Güstrow. And Güstrow was the town in which he lived since 1910. He moved there uh, with his son at that time, uh, lived his mother there. And she, he, he lived there and, uh, to the end of his life. So where in the world are we? So Craig told me nobody can understand this map. <laughs> but if I had given you a larger map, I would not find the small town of Gustro. <laughs> it's a very small town. So I'll orient you a little bit. So picture northern Germany. Berlin is here, so the Polish border is here. 
Um, Netherlands is here, the border is here. This is the North Sea. This is the Baltic Sea, or you can say the corner of the Baltic Sea. And this here, the border to Denmark. Yeah, so you have a little bit of an orientation. So we are in the flat land of northern Germany. And the cities in which he lived, yeah, born in Wedel. Wedel is very close to the big city of Hamburg. He grew up, his father was a medical doctor. He grew up in Ratzeburg and in Schoenberg. This is uh, very close or at the uh, Baltic Sea. He studied, starting at the age of 18, in Hamburg, going to the School of Applied Arts. So you could say learning to do ceramics, applied arts. And followed that in Dresden, so Dresden is not on the map. <coughs> um, four years, Ac Academy of Art. So after those seven years, he's 25. And that is his self-portrait at that age. <clears throat> in Hamburg, so at that school, at the age of 19, he wrote letters to his best friend who was a year older. <clears throat> the texts that you hear tonight, and this is also the credit I want to give, I owe to Naomi Groves, who in 1937, when his Balas work was confiscated and hardly to be found, she traveled to Germany. She was a, you can say, a researcher writing a PhD about artists. And she was interested in artists who have not one art being a sculpture, but multiple. And he has three, yeah, as you heard. So, all the texts you hear are her translations, and for me, they are more accessible because she did an, throughout her life an incredible work and also helped that some of his dramas that he wrote became known, uh, available in, in our language here, and um, <clears throat> have entered this continent. Balach writes, being 19 years old, of the three ways in which human life can be depicted, sculpture, painting and drawing, and narration in words. The first for me as a sculptor must naturally be the most familiar and desirable. I have to make careful observations constantly keep my eye on my work, both from in front and from behind, as well as from the right and the left. My hand and my modeling tool must be able to give form to whatever my eye has gauged and measured. I reproduce not merely what I see for my own part, nor what I see from this angle or that angle but what is the real, the true, which I must first seek out from within whatever I see before me. Life is so infinitely rich. Every glance from my window down into the street or into the schoolyard below where the young people romp during school recesses, is a profitable expedition. A walk through the street, a bit of time spent sitting quietly in a restaurant, can make me aware of a vast range of delightful scenes. I am learning that it is my duty to work and to develop the talents 
with which, unfortunately, I am too diversely endowed. Meanwhile, I work along steadily. The purpose of my profession is to give visual form to human character and action. That encourages me to describe these things in words as well. I busily continue my efforts as a writer, though the products are relatively slim. This he wrote when he was 19 to his friend, who is a year older. So he was able to speak about the purpose of his profession. So he went, as I said, to the schools, and at the end in Dresden, as a master student, he came up with his masterwork. So master, masterwork, yeah? You have a master class, and then you come up with your final work. Girl gathering greens, greens in the garden. And he writes about that he saw her in the garden of his mother, bending down and picking up greens, that he makes his masterwork. So after being 25, times in Paris, in Hamburg, in Berlin, going back for three years to where he was born, incognity, so to speak, nobody knew him. Then five months as a teacher at a ceramic school near the Rhine. When he exhibited in Berlin, Berlin was the scene, yeah, the, so there was at that time a scene in Paris and one in Berlin, yeah, art scene. The critic spoke about him, he's looking for his ways, he hasn't found his talent, he hasn't developed, so that you understand him a little bit. Happiness lives in someone else's home, one of his writings. Happiness lives in someone else's home, not mine. And she keeps house for other people and rests her shining eyes on them, not me. To all of them, she shows her loving features and friendly attentions, prepares comforting poultices when they have heartache and smooths their hateful wrinkles from their frowning forehead deftly and neatly so that their brow becomes serene and their glance free and happy. Yes, and how I wish that she and I could share a home like that and that she let her eyes shine on me. But happiness longs to be on the move. She's homesick, but her homeland is not mine. So being, you can say, searching, in Vail, in Cognitive, so to speak, the people in the town don't know that he's an artist. He's renting a place, a store, and in the storefront he put agricultural machinery. So the people in the village thought he was somebody who sold agricultural machinery. And in the back of the store he lived and maybe also worked. It's not that he didn't do anything. He did a lot, yeah, he uh, did lith lithographs and woodcuts and illustrations and worked for a, you can say, magazine youth, yeah? So he did a lot. And then, in this misery, so to speak, he travels to visit his brother in southern Russia, Ukraine. He has three brothers. One is one year younger than he, and then twins two years younger than he. They um, immigrate to America. So with one of his brothers, he's visiting Russia for two months. And as he did always in Paris, everywhere, he made sketches. What he sees, he pencils it down into notebooks, 1906 and you recognize her, Russian beggar woman. 1906, blind beggar. These were ceramic, 
glazed, yeah? So not yet wood. He hasn't started yet in wood. So these two pieces exhibited in Berlin brought the change. The same critique who had, sp uh, had spoken before now said, there is somebody coming. These are my words, yeah? There is somebody who is forming, finding form. Next year, this is the form. When you think of a beggar, the gesture of a beggar is, I need something that you might have and I am in need of. It is not who I am, how I look to you, but it is my relationship to you of need. Can you, can you see the gesture? Yeah? So when you heard, remember his words, 19 years old, to seek the inner in what is in front of me, then here I would say you can understand him, what he's seeking. So I show you now, throughout the evening, works of his in chronological order, more or less. Yeah? And I invite you that before I give you any title, they all have titles, um, that you live into the gesture. 1909. Have you ever done this? The Stargazer, yes. 1910 in Oak. This is a bronze cast, but it was um, the original was in, in wood. Where is she with her awareness? Is she looking at you with a friendly face and saying, who are you? Yeah, so hands folded by myself. Title, Brooding Woman. English title always, right? Also, 1910. So some titles are by Ernst Barlach and some titles are by his contemporaries. Sometimes he even says, definitely not mine, yeah? The one who goes be berserk, yeah, it's not maybe quite the right word to say, but when we say berserker in German, yeah, we mean somebody who powerfully, yeah. So you, you, you can see he has a weapon, yeah, and he has a very clear intention, yeah. Everything in his body shows. So two people looking up, the fists down like this, leaning back, looking up. This is plaster. He has then worked it into a wooden sculpture. So he speaks about his method in saying, it was my principle first to do it, re to do it relatively small because then the details wouldn't matter so much, and I could work on the gesture. Yeah? Easily to understand. Yeah, the fine features of face or garments don't need to be worked out. Gesture. Panic, fear is what he wanted to... This is what he speaks about this. Panic, fear. There are also drawings. Many of these sculptures are first conceived in drawings. And drawings, of course, can have many, many, many lines. So the gesture can show through. The moment you put it into bronze or wood, that is, yeah? Now it's in stone. So 
So this is his self-portrait much later than what I, the time I'm now speaking about. Um, but you can see his character already in his face. So this was 1928. I'm now speaking about 1914. From his diary. On Saturday, August 1st, 1914, at about 6 p.m., I was in our garden with Klaus, my son, who is now about eight years old. So on Saturday, August 1st, at about 6 p.m., I was in our garden with Klaus. I walked around the potato patch while he was busy with his own affairs. There came the sound of a bell ringing, one single note at first, then silence for a moment, as if to catch breath before the second note, without my paying any special attention as yet. For at that particular moment, I had forgotten the war which hung in the air. I was strolling beside my potato patch, enjoying the quiet evening garden peace. But my ear must have nonetheless been disturbed by the sound, and there flashed through my mind a memory of similar sounds of bells ringing a fire alarm. Then came the moment of shock, as when a stage curtain suddenly falls or when a wall collapses. For the alarm was now tolled with full force, passing from one bell tower to the next. Inside of me, I felt deep silence spread an emptiness expand, in the midst of which a surmise formed. It was a proclamation of the coming war. In September, he writes, I have been at work on my storming ber berserk, and it begins to be important to me to me, this berserk is a crystallized essence of war, the assault of each and every obstacle. I began it once before, but cast it aside. Now the unbearable is necessary to me. This sculpture is normally known as the Avenger. So done in done in wood. I believe, he writes at the beginning of the war, I believe that anyone who wants to depict the war should first learn how to depict cold. Clammy cold, the east wind that bites into the flesh the freezing breath of the dark winter morning, the perishing cold of winter sunrise. These are harder to stand than many other things labeled heroic. He did this sculpture in 1917. You see the wakeful eyes Shivering girl. In November of 1914, so the war just started, he writes, Every day now, trains pass through our railway station with refugees from East Prussia. 
As soon as they come to a halt, the women and girls of the town converge through the streets, bearing baskets and bottles of milk. Milk for children is most specially needed. And then those uprooted models, shaken loose from their fields as if by an earthquake, confused, actually numbed by this incomprehensible reality. They stand at the open doors of the cattle cars and stare into the unknown from which someone's hands hold out bread to them. But it helps that last only to the next station. One railway worker told me that they are headed for Magdeburg. They themselves know only that they are moving farther and farther into territory that is foreign to them. This is what he observed. And this is a sculpture, the refugee. And you can see all forward, this is left behind, the unknown. After the war, 1924, I believe. So these are partially photos that my sister and I took at the exhibition. This is one of those. And therefore, a close up. And this is Barlach. In this ultimate moment of need, hunger, starvation. The mother holds the child and there is her cloak around. Can you see the gesture? Yeah. 1926. Now we are here. Because this is the one sculpture where we can walk around. You, you heard when 19-year-old Balach said, when I sculpt, I have to sculpt from the front and the back on the right and the left. Yeah, it's very different than making a relief or a half relief where a statue stands against the wall, which he also did. So, you're welcome, of course, afterwards to take a closer look. But what I at least can do is, I can turn this around, yeah? Can, can you see uh, from where you are? And um, maybe you stand up for a moment, if, yeah, if you want to. So, two figures. This figure from the back. So a very upright posture and more narrow here than here. So as if the real standing was up here and not down on the earth, yeah? <coughs> and then these two are holding on to each other, yeah? So this arm here rests on the shoulder, this arm here grasps underneath the arm. On the other side, this arm here grasps here to the hip, you could say, and holds the arm here. And this person is now not the easy uprightness, but the bend, you know how, yeah? And holding on. So, 
This is now the title that Balach gave the sculpture. Das Wiedersehen. Wiedersehen is the German word for saying goodbye, and literally it means again seeing. So when I say Auf Wiedersehen, I say, I hope to see you again. Auf Wiedersehen, we say goodbye. Das Wiedersehen, the seeing again. In English, the sculpture is known as the reunion. It's a little different, right? Yeah, the reunion. But Balach said more. He said who these two figures are. He said, this is Thomas. This is Christ. At the end of the St. John's Gospel is a scene where Christ appears or is with his apostles in a room where the doors are locked. And he speaks to Thomas and says, put your hands into my wounds and yeah, my side. Because Thomas, eight days ago at Easter, said, I cannot believe the resurrection unless I can put my hands into the wound and my hands into the side. This is the sculpture, 1926 in Walnut and 1928, The Singing Man. This sculpture is presumably the best known. Um, I saw it for the first time in Chicago. So in this country exhibited. Also many other works you find in, in museums here. 1930, what is this gesture? Kneeling, hands together, looking up like this. Having doubts, doubting. And you can see in kneeling down and that this is an existential doubt. This is not, I doubt whether my husband will come on time or something, that's not that, yeah? This is a very existential asking and doubting. What does it mean when hands are held like this? And when you look at the face, hands and also face features have become important. I would say this is a face of a man at ease. He is not hurried, he is not worried, he is not anxious, he is not an avenger. He is maybe wanting to give something. The Teaching Christ. 1932. It's beautiful to see how this book is laid open for both of them. And the one is more the listener, and the other is the one who looks into the text. Can you see it? And there's a unity. Both are emerged in what the book wants to give them. The reading monks. One can one can see, right? Garments a little bit. A flute player.
1936. This sculpture goes back to drawings that Ernst Barlach did in 1912 already. So as often with this and other sculptures, the sculptures have evolved. So there was a moment where he grasped something, it became part of his notes, notebooks, portfolios, and he would look at them and they would grow, they would evolve. There is a lithograph, very, a drawing very much like this, yeah, a man sitting with a book, and it is entitled, For Whom Time is Eternity. Can you feel into being in certain books, maybe not all books, that being in books, time can become like eternity? Yeah, when you, when you enter into something where you say, this is, I understand, this is true, I understand, you participate in something that is not for now and for tomorrow, but was and is and will be, yeah, for whom time is eternity. And you can see that his eyes right now are not directed towards the script, the book. He's not right now reading. He has taken it in, right? He's thinking about it. So now I show you two more sculptures where I do, couldn't find uh, when they were created. Um, we uh, took those photos 10 years ago, right? Die sinnende Frau, sinnen is, we often in English would say contemplating, yeah, but it's sinnen, you, yeah, inward, her hands. The old woman sitting, old age. And this is Balach again, to give dignity to all phases and moments we can get into, even moments of great pain and great temptations. So you remember maybe that since 1910, so for 28 years, he lived in Gustro. Gustro is a town north of Berlin, 50 maybe miles uh, from the Baltic Sea, small town. And this is the church in Gustro. And this is in the church. I am now entering into the great public works that he was commissioned with at the end of the 20s. So this was um, created 1927. The great works in Güstrow, in Magdeburg, in Kiel, in Hamburg were war memorials. Memorials to those who had fallen, we say in German, fallen, the fallen soldiers. Those who have died. This is a war memorial. And this is what Balach writes about it to his niece. Her name is Elizabeth Liesel, and she lives in America. So he writes a letter to Liesel. It is on the back of a photo. Memorial to the war dead of the parish of Gustro Cathedral. 
the angel is suspended from the vault of the North Chapel. Below it is a wrought iron railing, within which a stone is set into the floor with the dates 1914 to 1918. Close by, against the wall, is a lectern on which lies a thick book. It took a very thick book, containing on each page in beautifully illuminated writing the name and date of death of one of the fallen soldiers. Many people are critical of my work, but I can stand their talk, and so can the angel. <laughs> it will hang there peacefully in its place for a hundred years or more, hang without moving as it does today. Its thoughts are with the victims of the war. Its eyes are closed. Nothing distracts it from remembering. I send you loving greetings, dear Liesel, and thank you for your letter. So these were in preparation for the memorial. Sketches. And you can see that here's an enormous band in the back. Here the hands are folded beneath the body. So he did not have the form. He had to find the form. He had to find the form that would express what he just expressed to his niece. This is how the form then was made. And this is larger than um, we are. Yeah, so that long. I have seen it at the exhibition in full size. Keeping the memory, being not distracted by anything. That's what the war memorial wants to do. Besides Gustro Cathedral, he was given another commission. At that time, so end of the 20s, you find in his diary, there was so much, yeah? He said, but, and when I had several commissions running at the same time, the tool in my right hand wouldn't fit to the tool in my left hand, and I would take my cigar as a pencil, <laughs> yeah? Just picture on the side, he also writes dramas. And he keeps doing little drawings. Yeah, so this photo, historical photo from an archive, shows you the proportions. And here we have it in color. These are letters. And the first is to Reinhard Pieper in Munich. He was a publisher. He published uh, quite a bit of his works, yeah, the beautiful volumes of his woodcuts and so forth. He writes, 1928. The time has flown for me. Since spring, I have been busy with the work for Kiel, city of Kiel. You lose yourself in the task of such outstanding proportions. The work devours you. While you think you are mastering it, in reality it is you yourself who are being chewed to bits. <laughs> then in November, to the chief city architect of Kiel, at last the stage has been reached where I can announce to you the completion of the composite figure, Angel and Beast. It now stands in Noack's courtyard, that's the Bronx foundry in Berlin, 
that all these come from, and justifies my efforts. I am convinced that the technical execu execution of the casting is flawless. To characterize the work as in the notice that you mentioned, the notice was victory of the church over its enemies, is stupid. <laughs> the combined figure might be called overcoming self-conquest. A couple months later, in a letter to his brother, public reaction to this work, as also to the cathedral angel, has been frosty and negative. Two days ago, the sword was actually bent and broken off during the night. All the right-wing parties have unsheathed their weapons against me. Worse is the hate campaign on the part of the fatherland clubs, especially the steel helmets. These gentlemen operate anonymously behind the smoke screen of non-accountability. I am on the lookout for proofs, black on white, and shall be obliged quite against my inclination to proceed with legal action. Letter to Reinhard Pieper again, and to his brother, same year. What a calm before the storm. All these people, Nazis, steel helmets, instinctively my enemies, hating me in the inexplicable steering of their very blood, will, if occasion arises, not handle me with kid gloves. I am determined to defy them. They shall not triumph over me. I think that time, which is on my side, will be against them. In any case, it will be no peaceful old age for me. In 1937, so a year before he died, in letters to friends, precisely on April 20th, Hitler's birthday, my champion of the spirit, that's the English title. The German title is Der Geistkämpfer, meaning the spirit fighter. Not thus named by me, to be sure. So the public name names it, yeah? The, the spirit fighter. So be, be precisely on April 20th, my champion of the spirit not thus named by me, to be sure, but generally known by that title, was removed from the University Church in Kiel. Nomen est omen, away with a spirit, with intellect. This belongs to those works which have achieved their final form from the specific requirements of their setting and which were designed expressively for it and formed a single unit with it. Another war memorial, this time in the big city of Hamburg, a large slab of limestone and then engraved. War memorial. 21 meters, so let's say 22 yards high. In the town hall square, the main place of the inner city. So on this side is water, yeah, the little Ulster is a water and then a large place, you can see. Very special place. War memorial.
1933, the months before Hitler took power, Ernst Barlach was named Knight of Peace Class, Orde pour le Mérite. He was suggested by Max Liebermann and Käthe Kollwitz. Other people who hold this honor are Käthe Kollwitz, Albert Schweitzer, Albert Einstein, for instance. In 1937, 381 works of Ernst Barlach were removed from public galleries and museums and were labeled degenerate art. The Gustro Angel was taken down and melted down. That it, we have it today again hanging in Gustro and also, for instance, in, in a church in Cologne, is due to the fact that the mold was still there in Berlin at the foundry. And secretly, during the war, a cast was made from that mold because the mold then was destroyed by the bombing in 1944 of Berlin. But the cast existed and then other casts could could come. This is how it survived. The memorial column in Hamburg was taken down, confiscated as degenerate art was, for instance, Das Wiedersehen, the reading monks. So Ernst Barlach was given a ban on exhibition. He writes, in the year he dies, he dies in October, he writes in April, have I anticipated the epoch to come? In giving form to these times, can and should I not be overwhelmed by them? I will not let myself be overwhelmed. However, I cannot avoid being put out of commission. For over a year, I lack all peace of mind for work. I am unable to cope with all this. It paralyzes me physically. I expect I have always lived in this time, the time of tortured innocence. It already existed and has merely taken on coarser coloration. A sense of panic at things being this way was always with me, even in the few so-called happy years. I had to fight hard for freedom from inhibition. Today, the wicked wind blows cruelly hard, but even that is no cause for looking upon all as lost. One of his last works, so this year when his works were confiscated, they were destroyed or sold to foreign countries. He couldn't exhibit anymore, he couldn't work. Yeah, he was pacing in his studio, as his life partner describes, with sad eyes, not knowing what he was doing there anymore. So this is one. So this year, 1937, he calls das schlimme Jahr. So we, you would say maybe the bad year, but it's more the evil year, das schlimme Jahr. This is das schlimme Jahr. When you now look, das schlimme Jahr, hands are not visible anymore. A gesture of all the other gestures, not there anymore. The garment drapes it all. But one gesture is left that we often don't take as a gesture. But that was here a very clear pronounced gesture. That is a gesture of being upright. Standing upright, this is the gesture this form has. I do not let myself be overwhelmed. He dies six months after this letter, you can say of broken heart. But as he said, time was on his side. 
the war memorial in Hamburg stands again. What you have seen is nowadays picture. The fighter for the spirit, as we in German say, the champion of the spirit, stands again in Kiel at the church. And not only in Kiel, also in Berlin and maybe in other places. The angel hangs again in Güstrow, not in the north side, but in the south chapel. And you find, and I found this on the internet, you find his sculptures worldwide. This sculpture is called, in this place, Matka Siemia, Poland, German. He made it in 1920. Mother Earth, Mutter Erde. With this, I would like to close. Thank you.